welcome to Retail Can today we're going to cover the TRS-80 the Model 1 again and this is my Model 1 which you may have saw in part 1 uh, part 1 was just a quick view of the machine itself and to you know introduce you to a machine that I had when I was a child it was my second machine I ever bought the original TRS-80 the Model 1 was introduced in 1977 yes 1977 this was really one of the precursor machines to all of the machines that sort of started trundling out in the early 1980s and because of that it has a few shortcomings it was originally shipped with 4k of memory it has a full-size keyboard which is a rather nice tactile keyboard but this machine with level 2 basic and the original keyboard has the key bounce but if you keep the keys clean and you know in good condition it's not so bad they do suffer from it but it's not as bad as it could be now there was a 75 pound upgrade for a, a much better keyboard um, one that wasn't based on open mechanics under the caps here but I'm not so sure if um, most people went for it because generally when these were new they didn't get the bounce so much and it was only as they started aging do you get the bounce on the keyboard but keep them clean and it's fine they don't have any real form of expansion predominantly it's cassette driven and the cassette drive on this was very very flaky it was very sensitive and again that wasn't unusual for the time the monitors repurposed television sets and they were originally silver and black. Um, a lot of them didn't come without this shield on it and it was just what you see behind the shield. But this one's got this nice clear perspex or plexiglass screen cover and it manages to protect the monitor really, really well. This one has a little bit of wear and tear on it but it is an early model and it is decades old so to be honest for a machine that's kind of 40 years old um, it's done rather well so the TRS-80 does have its shortcomings but the original machines were shipped with only 4k of memory 4k not a lot but when you consider that the original color computer was shipped with the same amount of memory the ZX81 was shipped with 1k the VIC-20 was shipped with 5K with only about three and a half able to be used in basic. Um, it wasn't that bad, so it wasn't as bad as it sounds. Um, they could be upgraded to 48K. Um, most of them were either 4 or 16K as kind of the rule of thumb for these machines. Now disk drives you couldn't really expand the disk drive into this machine as it was um, it had to be connected to an expansion unit and these expansion units were quite hefty they sat underneath the monitor and they plugged in via another unshielded ribbon cable and again if you saw my last video the RF output of these is horrendous it's just horrendous and it interferes with things like modern smartphones if you're too close to it um, you know I picked up the RF on a, a modern smartphone by being literally about this far off of the machine when I did some filming that was intentional to try and get or try and give you an idea of what the RF interference really was because you don't think about that these days really so um, yeah they they were horrible for radio interference but you know time moved on it's not so much of a big deal but today i'm actually using a sony professional camcorder a little bit further back in fact a lot further back um so i don't pick up any interference today so they do suffer from rf interference um power supplies you know they're, they're quite bizarre because you've got a single power supply and it runs both things and then I always thought that was a little bit dangerous because you have a power supply which is a Tandy power supply and it's basically what it seems to have been is something they already had 
in their catalogue of parts because remember Tandy and Radio Shack were an electronics and electrical retailer. So it's a, a 240 volt UK spec, um, 50 hertz, 17.6 volts DC power supply at 350 milliamp. And now this power supply runs 17 volts remember runs the actual computer and the TV it's all connected to one supply and you know that was quite a neat solution but it's a very dangerous solution because you've got basically two machines run off one power supply which you have two separate power leads connected to one socket to one outlet you know maybe um, in kind of the modern day and age you we would not get away with that we would never have gotten away with that now but um, at the time you know standard practice you know let's just plug whatever you can into the mains and worry about whether or not it's protected later so it's not an ideal situation and one that I actually don't feel that is very safe not nowadays I mean you know you but you are talking 1970s but at least it's grounded in the UK but um, you kind of worry about these non-grounded outlets that are in other countries whether or not it's gonna cause a problem but um, you know at least you got the um, the added protection for being grounded but you know it works it's been working since 1977 so you know Maybe our um, modern sensibilities, we're, we're kind of a little bit overprotective these days. Maybe, maybe not. But um, that's the way it was. So, the TRS-80, okay, it wasn't a bad machine. The specifications of the machine are, it was Tandy Corporation who manufactured it, sold through Radio Shack outlets, mainly in the US, in the UK, it was sold through the Tandy Corporation or the Tandy Shop Outlet, so it was rather different. The release date was August 3rd in 1977 and it was $399 at the time, which was very cheap for a, a computer, especially at the time. It lived until January 1981 and it sold about 100 thousand units up until the end of 1979 so I'm guessing they manufactured a roughly a hundred thousand units and that's what they based their sales on um, and they cleared their stock over the next 18 months or so and it was TRS DOS that was its kind of operating system he used a Zilog Z80 CPU at 1.774 megahertz. It had four kilobytes to 48 kilobytes worth of memory. Later units used the Z80A processor as its main processor, but they're largely compatible with each other. But by 1979, the TRS-80 had possibly, in fact, not possibly, it had the largest catalog of software of any computer on the market which is why it sold quite well and then when they brought the model 3 out which was largely compatible with this it was almost a rebadged reboxed model 1 with disk drives and its expansion interface built into basically a single unit similar to the pet style um, it continued on that sales track of having a great software library so the sales of the model 3 were very good but the model 1 was discontinued at that point now to the display the display had 1k of video ram that is it so it had quite a bizarre screen display at the time it was 64 by 16 which you know 64 across is brilliant it was kind of really up there for you know basic word processing it was better than the 40 characters of most machines at the time but the 16 was far short of even you know the later models like the zx spectrum and the commodore 64 etc um and 16 characters down was very limiting um but 
the 64 characters across was brilliant. It was almost like a kind of an early setup from a teletype machine. It was, you know, quite wide, but very kind of narrow. So um, it wasn't the best, but it wasn't certainly wasn't the worst, but it could only display lower case unmodified because I think they saved about a dollar or so on each, um, actually it's probably less than that on each machine by not including lower case in the ROM, which was a big no-no really. It was, it stopped at making inroads into the serious business market because you don't really want to get a letter full of uppercase characters really. Um, so unmodified, it was uppercase only. And the sound, the sound, it really didn't have any sound as I mentioned in my previous video. It would use the audio line for the cassette port to produce sound. So if you plugged a little amplifier into the cassette lead, you'd be able to get sound or tones out of it. And some of them were quite good for the time. Um, but again, it was kind of a short coming of the machine. No sound, no color, black and white with a modified black and white TV set for a monitor. Not going to be too down on this machine because I actually like this machine. I like using it. It was nice to type on. It had a decent basic. It was, you know, I didn't have the monitor when I had this machine. I had a small TV set, which was fine for my, what I wanted it for being a black and white machine anyway. And, um, you know, I didn't really find that much of limitations because I came from a ZX81, which had a much worse keyboard, less memory and so on. So, you know, it was a step up to a lot of machines that were out there at the time. We have to look at it in context. But when you compare it to the likes of the ZX Spectrum, um, the Commodore 64 and other machines that were out there at the time, or just after this machine was launched, it was seen as a, a kind of a retrograde step for most people, um, unless it was purely kind of businessy sort of technical software then this machine kind of shone because of its software catalog okay so i don't normally read passages but this one is quite a good one okay um basically we had a a review in the byte magazine of 1978 and it was that as an appliance computer, the TRS-80 brings personal computing a good deal closer. Okay. And that's to the average customer, suitable for home and light business use, which it was because it wasn't any different to the Commodore PET at the time for usage wise. Um, it concluded it's not only an alternative for aspiring personal computer use, but a strong contender. And he also remarked that the basic TRS-80 was a lot of computer for the money, which it was, $399 at the time. And basically he um, also criticised the high cost of peripherals and software because Tandy wouldn't license anything. Everything that Tandy sold for this machine was Tandy owned, Tandy based. It, there was no third party kind of software for this machine. Um, and that also for the peripherals, the peripherals are all Tandy badged, you know, Tandy proprietary interfaces. So they, they had the monopoly and they could charge higher prices. So he had a point. The peripherals were expensive and the software was for this machine. But it was CPM compatible, which was a bonus back in 1977, which, you know, when you think about it, CPM was the go-to operating system at the time. But that love affair, that initial love affair in the Byte magazine um, for Dan Flastra, I hope I pronounced his name right, um, he said three years after the fact, um, it wasn't such a good machine. And I'll read from what he said. He was less positive about the computer, he wrote in May 1983. Um, we trashed that sucker long ago. It was always unreliable and repeated trips to the local Radio Shack outlet didn't help. The problem was Tandy cut corners. And yeah, you know, the, the biggest problem was as Tandy cut even more corners as sales ramped up because they couldn't keep up. They couldn't keep up with 
the demand so corners were cut on this machine which kind of got it the moniker of the trash 80. He also wrote I'm a little bitter about my experience with the Tandy 1. Um, I generally thought that the Model 1 was a machine of the future an inexpensive home computer that could be expanded by stages until it could do professional work his words but of course it was never that he believed that Tandy tried to fence the Model 1 with a goofy operating system and it wouldn't let Radio Shack stores sell non-Tandy software which we've said um, and it had never been that well designed when sales took off more than anticipated the quality system couldn't cope which as we mentioned it couldn't now these were his words but this machine is over 40 years old 40 years old and it still works so really how bad was the quality control I mean I know a number of Apple machines and I've got a number of Apple machines that are useless they are dead they don't work they've got faults they don't power up properly they don't read discs they don't do so on. they don't produce what they should have been doing they have screens which are fading they have basically all manner of issues where this is just turn it on and it's got a nice display after 40 odd years it's still got a nice bounce to the keyboard and the keys it's still very solidly put together 40 years after the fact or 44 years after the its construction date so I don't know if kind of you know he'd moved on to different machines within that three years but the quality wasn't that bad really I mean the plastics aren't brittle they aren't falling apart to be honest the paint the paint is the biggest protector on these machines because they protect the plastics underneath so yeah um, they haven't lasted too badly so I kind of differ with his um, view but his view was 40 odd years ago so we can give him a bit of um, a bit of leeway on that one so first what do I think of this machine I actually like it I like the machine itself it's got a, a lot of nostalgic memories for me anyway um, I like the way it kind of looks it I like the way it's put together really it's not badly put together it's not crude um, although maybe the interfaces are crude and the cabling's crude um, but you know everything else isn't that massively cost cut um, and it's a nice enough machine to use to kind of potter around and then relive kind of the days of basic etc so yeah it's it's nice it's good it's a good quality machine really if you compare it to some of the absolute rubbish that was on the market at the time so let's take a look at some of um, the TRS-80's games and also what it could do So I hope you enjoyed this wander down memory lane uh, with the TRS-80 Model 1 or the TRS-80 as it was known when it first came out and I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you appreciate one of these machines a hundred thousand.
were built. There can't be that many circling the globe anymore. So this is going to be a one well looked after but unrestored machine because it's had a life. And um, I hope you join me again for more. More on classic computers, more on classic software, more on what these machines could do, who built them, who designed them, and interviews of the people who were around in the day. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Please subscribe. Thank you.